And now, to the event of today, our keynote speaker this afternoon has been involved in research over the years with tens of thousands of schools and millions of students. I find that hard to believe, Ron. Millions of students? But that's the information I got. Millions of students. Teachers, <laughs> they don't all know him personally, he says. Students, teachers, parents, and administrators. He's now involved in a project to improve school climate for children and military families. We are so privileged today to have with us Dr. Ron Abby Astor, the Richard M. and Ann L. Thor Professor of Urban Social Development, who holds joint appointments in the USC School of Social Work and the USC Rossier School of Education. Ron will be addressing military connected school children challenges and solutions. Ron? I want to start off by saying uh, that uh, one of my favorite um, rabbis, uh, I never met him, but he wrote a lot, Maimonides uh, from the late 14th century, who was the physician to the king of Spain, uh, talked a lot about that the, the highest level of giving, the highest level of charity is actually to give to a group of people who you don't know and who they don't know you. And then they don't know that you gave and you don't know that you gave to them specifically and perfectly. That's a very hard thing to do if you think of that because people don't like to do that. And by chance, I'm also the national chair of the Education Book Award for the Book of the Award year. And the book that won this year, don't ever volunteer to be a chair of a book committee, by the way. It's like 100 plus you know, books a year. You need another doctorate when you finish. And one of the, the book that won this year that I'm actually going to Philadelphia tomorrow to give uh, to the book award winner, it's great. It's like, you know, and they have like uh, 16,000 people there for the book award ceremony. One of his findings was with all the evidence-based programs that we have and all the efforts that we do, by the way, this is very important for social work, I think. Um, the programs that seem to be working, now hold on to your seats right now, uh, 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 require a tremendous amount of work. <laughs> and many hours and lots of different people. Now, you know, that's why I said hold on to your chairs because, you know, it's duh. Uh, but, but, but when you look at the, at the programs and what we do, people forget about that. I mean, I actually live, you know, with my wife and, and, and we, don't, we see each other, but we're working a lot because we care about different programs and my kids. If we care about something, it's a lot of people, it's a lot of effort, and it's like the Maimonides thing. Some people who never see the actual product and the product doesn't actually see the people, but they get connected. Uh, I would like you to hear some of the voices of the students themselves who are on the project. Hopefully this works. My father has been deployed at least over eight times. My father's been deployed six or seven times. Four or five My times. My dad has been deployed He's been eight or nine times. Seven My father's been deployed three times. Deployed right um, now. My dad's deployed all, all right now, Iraq. and he's been deployed ever since. He's like, fixing to deploy again. I've moved seven or eight times. Four or five times. South America, North Carolina, Virginia, Virginia. Palms, New York. I'm moving to Florida. Uh, Alabama. Europe. Florida. And Arizona. Texas. California. I don't remember the rest. Why do we have to move everywhere? Like, you know, like every single day, it's just like you know, you're always thinking about him, thinking about like how how his day went, you know, what it's like where he is, and like, you know what what's pretty much going on with everything that he does. It's kind of like you're worried like all the time, you know. When my father is deployed, I'm scared that he might come home injured. When my mom's not around, I'll have no one to talk to and like, I'll have no one to help me on my homework when I really need it. I would be at home alone, trying to do my homework, and there's nobody to help me. Being the man of the house, it's pretty hard because I worry a lot about what's gonna happen, and I don't really pay attention. I help my mom out. I do whatever I can. And then as the months go by, I'm like just waiting to see him. 
they didn't know how to handle it because they don't really get that many military kids. And on a military base, they help us because they know what we're going through. Most of the kids didn't understand what I was going through. They were like, oh, your dad's military, that's no big deal. That can't, that can't be hard for you. That, that doesn't affect you at all. And they didn't understand, but in a military school, they understand what you're going through because you're going through it too. In a civilian school, they don't know to appreciate that. They don't know how you feel. So if something happens, they, they can't relate to that or understand. A lot of the schools, they have like kind of the same curriculum, like you know, being on base schools. Except for like you know this school here being an uh, off-base school, you know they go by like an entirely different curriculum than in other schools. They both do one different things. Like California does world history. Some other states just do their states' history. So it's kind of hard to deal with the different subjects because they might be in the middle of something new. It's pretty hard because when I moved out here from Minnesota, we were learning completely different things in each uh, core subject. Then I got out here and they were like way ahead of us and everything. Your grades take a while to transfer over if you go in the middle of the year. One school will be on Algebra 1 for 8th grade and another school will be on Pre-Algebra or something higher. One being like, I don't really know who my dad is at this point because he's gone so often. Two, dealing with the fact that we're constantly moving and not knowing what's coming next. Three, um, having people who don't understand you whatsoever. It's hard when he leaves. My dad gave me this dog tag. It says, Kaylee, be strong. I love you. Be home soon. Love, Daddy. So you'll hear deployments, you'll hear moves, you'll hear, but what, what was most interesting to me is my interest in this topic actually came through school safety and the idea that I didn't even know there were military kids in public schools at the time. We were seeing bullying, uh, we were seeing other kinds of outcome, but we didn't actually know that group was in public schools. Uh, most people in the United States actually think that they're in Department of Defense schools. They don't even realize they're in the common public schools that we're here right now. There's very few of them actually. There are about 86,000. The vast majority are in public schools and they're somewhat invisible. So they're the new kids on the block and they get bullied and they feel alienated because the rest of civilian culture is business as usual on the whole around the issue of the war. And what's most disturbing is if you look at the children of the veterans right now, we're talking about up to five million kids in public schools that are somewhat invisible. So it's still about school safety. It's still about feeling comfortable in your, but this is a group that we just as a civilian society have not thought about. And that's true for the drawdown as well with veterans that are coming into our communities. But this is right under our noses in our public schools. And what makes them most vulnerable is not only the deployments and the feelings of what's happening to my parents while they're uh, at war or uh, in, in a harmful situation abroad, it's the number of moves and the number of schools that they have as well. They're always the new kid on the block. Um, now, what I'm going to show to you in terms of what we did here, the prior work that we had done when Chaco was just two years old and Sheva uh, was starting to be a school principal, uh, I took a Fulbright year in Israel, and our work started uh, with the Israeli ministry and is currently in 3,000 schools, and that's how you get the millions. Um, uh, and what we described here actually started working in Israel uh, to build capacity. They've had 50, um, depending on the issue, it, it could be as low as 35, up to 60 percent reductions using the kinds of methods we're talking about here. Uh, a few years back, when I was giving a lecture uh, at the Sorbonne, the University of Paris, one of the professors there said, you know, you're talking about all this work in Israel, but, but, but what about what's happening with the kids whose parents serve in Iraq and Afghanistan in the United States? And for me, that was part of the big shift in terms of shifting and looking at U.S. public schools, because up until that point, I was looking at war around the world, uh, terrorism, community violence. I wasn't thinking about and I think the rest of civilian society as well here is kind of having an aha uh -huh 
experience here too. So when I came back, that's when I started finding out, in, in fact, they are in the public schools. Um, so we started this consortium that has about 145 uh, public schools with eight school districts that you saw on the initial page. And it is a community school consortium here in the San Diego, Camp Pendleton area. Uh, uh, Omar is here, he's part of helping getting it off the ground, Omar Lopez, and there's a variety of other people as well here too, Pam Francois and others, to try and get the schools to partner with us. And, uh, and this is the data that I'm gonna be showing you about in terms of that we have here. So our first goal was to actually teach our MSWs how to do the school social work with military connected kids in public school that had never been done before. We, that, that's never, we we're the first program. And since we had a military uh, pro, social work program, we adapted, uh, particularly in the San Diego area, some of the work that was there in these placements. The second one is because these kids were invisible, uh, where were they? Nobody quite knew if they were in their schools, wh wh which classes they were in, what their needs were. So we wanted to create a data-driven system so that we could pinpoint the problems to the right classes, what you had done in Israel as well, too, to the right schools, to the right classes, and provide the right resources and, and, and existing resources in the neighborhood, in the community, in the county, to the right places. Uh, and then expand those resources and uh, build the capacity. So those were the different goals. We're a little bit different than other projects uh, that focus only on individuals or only on groups of kids uh, from a clinical point of view. Uh, what we had done in Israel and we did here too is we actually focused on the whole school setting in addition to groups and uh, individual children. And that came from work uh, that we had done and we noticed that there were entire schools where the kids were exposed to war, exposed to terrorism, but they didn't have a lot of at-risk outcomes, even though their families and communities did. The school kind of served almost like a vaccine. If they were intended to have problems because of all the risk factors and they happened to attend those schools, they never became victims of bullying. They never got into drugs because of the peer group. So the school actually had the power, the context itself, of working almost like a prevention vaccine uh, uh, and that's how we modeled this as well, too. Uh, I'm not going to get into the, uh, uh, the details here. What I want you to know is our first step, I know, I know my Rami and the rest of the group always say, oh, no, don't show that slide. But, but um, I, I promised them I'd put it in anyways. Uh, so uh, the first step is to identify all the resources in the community. This is what social workers do all the time. But then, of course, work on a mass scale on how to build shared goals around the data and around the information, and then to actually work on pieces of infrastructure that exist and change those so they can serve those. There was not new resources, changing the existing resources that actually won't cost anything and could be sustained afterwards. And then monitoring that, almost like a social biofeedback system at every level that you could imagine, so you could follow what the teachers, what the kids, what the principals, what the parents, what the community organizations are thinking and doing, so you could adjust quickly uh, and actually find things from the ground up. And of course, issues of bullying, issues of substance use, issues of suicide, all the at-risk things that kids um, uh, we worry about, but they're all happening together in the same setting, even with the same kids. Uh, so this is kind of our model here. So we actually picked a, uh, an existing survey through the state of California, the California Healthy Kids Survey, and we were able to convince them to actually add a military child identifier and also one that could capture some of the veterans as well too, and we were surprised at how quick that went. And uh, they actually allowed us to develop a module, a military module uh, that is now being used the advantage of picking something that exists. It's available to all schools in California now. So we're actually gonna get for the first time the data right now, uh, every single secondary school and elementary school in California so we could identify military nomad for each school in each class and then direct resources. So that is an artifact of picking something that exists. Uh, now, it's different than other research methodologies. It fits more social work uh, in general because whatever we do, it hits lots of levels automatically because we pick those existing resources. So it's not just the individual child, it's not just the school, it's not just the region, and you know, in Israel it's national. Because you pick that indicator system there, 
you could then use that same data to compare schools with each other, regions with each other, the state with the schools, and that data is more interactive than if you just ran a study or if you just had a program, per se, that you were running for a short period of time. And you could follow it because it happens every year. So this is, again, getting to the millions. If you go over 15 years, you know, 3,000 schools in Israel and schools in France, and now here, it starts accumulating in terms of how many kids. Uh, now, we're also a little bit different in terms of our thinking and more similar to social work, in my opinion, because we not only look at evidence-based practices, those are really important, we're also finding the homegrown practices. Those are really important for us because we believe there are schools and there are teachers and principals and so forth that actually have good ideas. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe good ideas that are better than ours at the university system. And just like you have those study go and uh, study, let's say, cancer in a, a, a community that has very low rates of cancer and they shouldn't, uh, and you find out what they do and then you could develop interventions. Our data, because it's so comprehensive, you could actually find schools that have great ideas, things that work, and we could then spread those to other places that are easier to use and actually are, are new evidence-based programs. So. So I just wanted that. So when we started out our program, this is just an example, being afraid, being in a fight. Once we were able to separate the military and not, the big question is, are they having a bigger problem than the other kids or not? And clearly, these are just examples of them. They were in all the categories. Um, so now that we have the data system, we're able to see that these places were not connected with universities. So just to talk about scale a little bit. We added 85,000 hours, 250 new graduate student placements from all the various different universities. 40,000 hours, 500 undergraduate mentors to the school sites where they didn't, all these did not exist before and they don't cost any money right now. Uh, 4,000 students in pride clubs to deal with some of the issues that you saw that were mentioned. 3,000 students in deployment groups, again, weren't before because we now have the student placements that we're trained to do them. Uh, the community organizations were there, but they weren't connected to the exact places and the areas. So we were able to connect them to real-time places, issues, schools, so they could actually serve people, not just abstractly, but with real issues that they're presenting. One of the examples is we partner with the Navy to get a bus and park it on the school grounds and bring all the community resources to that school so the parents, teachers, uh, kids could actually get the resources in their community that were specific to what they said were there. And then training the school staff around the issues that were specific to their classroom or school. It's really different to know about suicide prevention in general, but to know if you're a fifth or let's say a seventh grade or a ninth grade teacher, if the question was, were you thinking about committing suicide, and the teacher knows that 25% of the kids uh, that are military are thinking of suicide, they treat that classroom very differently than if it's an abstract issue, and that was very important for us. And in terms of changing statewide policy, now the state of California and others are actually adding this identifier to all that LAUSD just did right now, so every kid is going to have a military an identifier in there, so we'll know. LA actually does not know how many they have or doesn't have because they've never asked. Um, I'm going to show you one more uh, video here of a student in one school because everything I said is kind of mass scale, overwhelming, big, but this is how one student in one school, what they did. And please notice the individual, the group, and kind of the school climate matching of, of understanding what military culture is, those three components. My name is Kim Becker. I am a USC School Social Work intern at Jefferson Middle School in Oceanside, California. Part of our uh, purpose is to engage military students in activities to help them with mobility issues, deployment issues, um, and other things that may arise because of their military culture. When a deployment occurs, things are happening at home that the educator can't be aware of unless they are aware of the students, um, what's going on at home. As a social worker and as an intern, um, that I've been able to assess situations or to ask kids questions that a school employee, or employee may not be able to ask or have the time to ask. Some of the clubs we have is Best Buddy Crew and Newcomers Group where all the new kids of the school come or we help do things like the help for pennies for peace, we count the pennies or 
we decorate the bottles. I'd say probably about 90% of the girls group is all, um, is mostly military. And everyone in that group suffered through, they've suffered through death, deployments, they suffered through everything I that I suffered through. So it's easier just to like let my emotions out in there instead of like in the middle of class. So when you have people like Kim Becker, it's instrumental um, for us to have here. Around the Marine Corps birthday, uh, she did a, a program, a cake cutting ceremony for all of our students. I got talking to some folks, the junior ROTC at Oceanside High School, and you know found that he was a retired Marine, and that his whole junior ROTC program, uh, the students do practice for the Marine Corps birthday ceremony and they were willing to come on over to Jefferson Middle School and to perform that ceremony at the school. I had a little light, little vision to have a birthday banner and to sign some cards for our Marines and just to recognize the military students on the campus and to let them know that, hey, we knew you're out there. We know that this is a tradition that your family um, participates in and we are recognizing you as the military child. It was unique for our military students to see and for our other community of students to see also, to see what a taste of military customs and traditions is like. I would love to see all of the schools across the nation be able to celebrate the Marine Corps birthday ceremony um, at any of the military impacted schools. It really will provide all of the military students with a sense of belonging and a sense of ownership to their public school. So one of the things I look for in this program is this being a safe haven for those students. Them being able to come in, have someone they can really connect with, develop a relationship with, and just share. Ms. Becker, she's helped me make a, lo make a lot of friends in these clubs, and if these clubs aren't here, I probably wouldn't even know half the people I know now. Mm. I guess Ms. Becker always gives me hope. Like, maybe my dad's gonna be like, he's gonna help, the war's gonna end, and like, it's gonna be over with. It's a lot for a child to experience. It's a lot for a child to have to deal with from their peers who don't understand what they're going through. And, that in and of itself strengthens that child's character. And I think our military kids are the strongest part of our military families. So imagine that over 145 schools, 120,000 kids approximately, and uh, that kind of, um, so I won't go through, I'm gonna flash through these quickly, but we found a lot of on the ground programs that were uh, ground up that we've been spreading quite a bit, like Partners in Learning with UCSD for tutoring, the Pride Clubs I mentioned, working with UCLA and Project Focus to work specifically in deployment groups again. Uh, uh, we worked with Omar again here to work with the Padres, they're doing it again in NASW to recognize military family kids and, and uh, distribute resources. All these have research components that we're collecting qualitatively and quantitatively to actually show their effectiveness, which is really important for us. This is just a nice picture of a ground up move of, of, of a project where the kids and that saw the data on bullying and decided to paint all their buses in Temecula and then the banks and the community members all started wearing purple and, uh, and, and, and black to recognize um, um, the um, uh, anti-bullying program that they created. It looks like there was some effectiveness to this too. So here's the bus I talked about earlier so you could just actually see that it was parked on school grounds. Uh, we were able to organize, this is Patty Shinseki, so you could see all the classic social work skills. The difference here is that we're collecting them all together and seeing how they work in concert with each other. Um, this has led to great uh, um, political uh, action at the, at the legislature level and again I mentioned in Los Angeles. We then decided also to create videos. So you could go onto our website and see model example places so that it's not just data speaking, it's kind of from the data, but you could see, for example, how gardens, like one school picked gardens to get the military families and kids, and then how that then spreads across all the various different schools and school districts as a, as a so how, what did we do? And this is about a year and a half worth of data, maybe 
to two years since by the time we started the interventions till afterwards. And you could see for issues of peer victimization, we're having reductions for the students uh, that are military in red, but also because of the whole school approach for the non-military. And we have tables, uh, go through them all with uh, substance use uh, and other kinds of uh, mental health outcomes that are also showing reductions. Uh, similar in the process to what happened in Israel, but this is a much shorter piece of time. We think these are probably going to continue when the program leaves. We're in our sustainability year, and it looks like they are. Here's an example of the substance use with the same kind of things, binge drinking, marijuana, LSD, psychedelics, reductions in all these categories in a relatively short period of time. Uh, this is being acknowledged by the White House. We had Jill Biden come and speak to us. That was very exciting uh, as part of the joining forces. And then uh, I, I mentioned Linda earlier and the group. We actually pulled together guides uh, in, in a collaborative process uh, to the voice of the teachers, principals, parents, social workers, psychologists, so that it's an easy to use, best ideas, best practices books published by Columbia Teachers College Press. Uh, if you'd like your own copy, there's a website here. You could actually go on there, request one, it'll be mailed to your house. And please visit our site too. There's tons of ideas, newsletters, um, and we're just excited if you know anybody who's military or veteran or schools or other, please feel free to use this material and spread it. And that's about it. I'm about two minutes over. So thank you very much. I don't know if you have any questions. You know, yes. Yeah, the question is, is it, is it because of the disparity between the number of people serving uh, versus those who are not serving? And we think actually that's part of the dynamic that's happening here in the United States. That's why we're putting so much of the efforts actually not targeting the military kids. If you notice, we're targeting the civilian population to make them more like it was in World War II, more welcoming, everybody crowd because that's part of the healing process. That's part of the integrate. It's not just clinical services, which is really are really important. It's moving them out into the community and educating those people who are coming in. As an example, uh, my earlier work, as I mentioned, is in Israel. So you know, most of the population there, except for parts of the Arab population and the ultra orthodox, serve. Uh, or do some kind of, and so there's a sense of understanding around war, around issues of terrorism, around suffering, death, loss, that is automatic because everybody's part of it. Here, part of the shock is uh, business as usual. Uh, they don't know what you went through, they don't know what's happening, so it's hard for them to respond in the classroom level, at the peer level. So that Marine's birthday piece had a big impact on those kids, not just uh, from an FYI perspective, this is what the Marines do, all the peers and the teachers kind of understood uh, what was in their classroom from a more personal level. So I think yes. I think part of the healing process is not the military and the families, it's, it's us. It's the civilians. Are we out of time? Great. Thank you.